Okay, let's pull ourselves back together and answer a couple of questions about, uh, that came up about the assignment, just so we can get them answered for everybody. In the assignment, there are a couple things about the structure where you're going to spend most of your time that uh, some people want some clarification on. One is the whole notion of uh, we say go ahead and put in some bracing. And when we say put in some bracing, I say go ahead and put in like one bent on each exterior like line. And that terminology may be a little bit different because I use strange terminology sometimes. But let me kind of explain to you what I have in mind. Oops, let me zoom to fit here. If I'm looking at the overall building here, what happens in terms of lateral bracing is we tend to have like bracing along the exterior walls. We also have this little interior core right around the stairs, and that can help out with uh, carrying some of the lateral loads too. But for the exterior walls, what I have in mind is along line A here, as well as along line H, and then on one and two, go ahead and put in some bracing just within one of those spacings. So for example, if you want to put in diagonal bracing oh, between B and C on line one, that's enough. That'll take care of really, it can be designed in a way that'll take care of the entire line one. Same thing with A, B on the line four here. Figure out where you want to go ahead and put it there. Now on line four there, you'll notice there's an awful lot of glass and all that type of stuff. So you know, this is going to be one of those discussion points where you're going to put it in somewhere and then you and the architect are going to have to work together about you know, how that's going to work, either as an architectural feature or as something that has to change in the architecture. But that's very, very common because you have that requirement unless we do something really exotic. So let's, uh, let's keep it simple for you, where you want to put uh, like one brace somewhere on A, one on H, one on four, and one on one. Oh, and at each level. So it would go up all three levels. So in terms of that, it's probably not going to be too bad to get it on the upper levels, because you have a lot more closed wall space up there. But on that lower level in particular, it's a little tough. So uh, based on your feedback as a structural engineer, we may need to either decide to celebrate your structure and like really uh, make it an architectural feature, or we might have to like uh, change our architectural scheme for the windows around a little bit. Interestingly, if you look at a lot of buildings today, you see an awful lot of exposed diagonal bracing that's painted up white and actually looks pretty good. So uh, even if you go over to the Wong Center, all the structural bracing around the core of those uh, atriums is exposed right now. Whereas in this building, you don't see it very well unless you go to the copy rooms. You can sort of see it in there. And it's back in the core there. Okay, so that's the structural bracing. The other question that came up had to do with the floor slabs. And there is already an architectural floor in there, each of the different levels. Go ahead and at that very same level, though, put in a structural floor. Okay, just put it right at this very same place. Eventually, when we bring them all back together, your structural floor is going to dominate. Okay, because we want your structural floor in there. We'll need it in there to put some loads on it so we can actually do our analysis. Okay, but that's a real common thing is to have both of them in there, and really, in terms of ultimately resolving the model, you know, there'll always be one that's showing. Yeah, you know, we just can't control which one's showing using visibility and graphics, but that's okay. Okay, we are now going to shift our attention to a slightly different tool that we're going to use in a number of different ways. It's called Navisworks Manage, and it's really like this incredible Swiss Army knife of very cool tools for helping you manage your models. Okay, and it kind of keeps on growing and changing and getting more powerful. But really, if you're doing anything that involves model coordination for construction, especially, you know, it is really the tool where you spend an awful lot of your time. And what's really cool about Navisworks is that it can work with models in a number of different formats. So Revit's great if you're going to stay within Revit. But as part of your project team, it's quite possible, in fact, likely, that oh, one of your consultants is going to be working in ARCHICAD, or one of your, or, or in uh, AutoCAD, or in Bentley, or in some other system. The chance that you're all going to be working on like uh, Revit would be very, very small. So we need a tool that will let you integrate together what I'll call a composite model. That's a model that pulls together all the different little pieces external to Revit, okay, so that you can really have that capability to pull things together and get your whole team working together. So to do that, we're going to open up um, Navisworks. But what we want to do is actually take our Revit models here and export them in a way that they can come into Navisworks. Okay. So what we need to do is as follows. When you install Navisworks, if you already have Revit installed, something will get installed in your program under the Add-ins menu, where Navisworks 2010 is there. And that's the one we're going to choose. 
For you structure students who are struggling with eTabs right now, you'll also notice that there's links to eTabs. It'll take our model out and let us take it over to eTabs and do the analysis there. So what we'll learn next session is actually how we go through and take a structural model that we've created in Revit and take it over to eTabs <laughs> to do the analysis. So you don't have to de define the geometry there. You can define it here and kind of go back and forth. That's what this is all about at the top. But let's go ahead and take a look at the Navisworks one. Navisworks is really all about just taking this existing model and exporting it and sending it out so that Navisworks can work with it. Now, as we do that, before we do that, let me go ahead and do this. Let me switch over to the default 3D view. And I like to go to the default 3D view. There's a sort of this issue about like what's showing in your view when you go through and do your export. Okay, and I never remember whether it's in QTO or in Navisworks. So uh, they're a little bit different in terms of what's going on. But I go to the 3D view and export that view to make sure I get all my objects. Okay, I don't want like a subset where I only get part of them. I really want to get the whole model. So I'll switch over to that view. And I'll say export it to Navisworks. I'll say OK to that. Interesting. Um, I'm going to choose, it's going to save it to a special file format called NWC, okay, which is just for transferring things across. And you can see I actually sort of exported them already. I created a structural model. I did it for the architectural model. I did it for the MEP model. So again, how you would do that is if you just choose like the structural model, that name, give it whatever name you want, V2. Save it away. What it's going to do is basically write out all the different elements. It's going to write them out in a common file format that Navisworks can pick up. Okay, so if you're familiar with oh, IFC or there's all these different formats for transferring things around, it's just a way of basically describing the elements, all the properties of the elements, as well as a description of the geometry in a common form that can be understood by other programs too. Okay, so we can do the same thing in architecture, we can do it in a structure, but ultimately, Pop on out there. Let me say export it. I'm going to take it to Navisworks. So I'll do the architectural model, V2. And I can do it for, uh, notice this one has a lot more elements to it. It has 1,400 pieces in this one. So I can do it MEP, I can do it structural, do it all these things. Now, for the purpose of your assignment, let me just kind of be very clear about that. For your assignment, you don't have to go through and do all this intersection and stuff like that. We'll do that as we move ahead into assignment four. So you're just putting the pieces in place. You don't have to worry about the conflicts right now. I expect you to have conflicts for right now. So give yourself that freedom. If you are planning ahead and really are working around that, super. Go ahead and like uh, you know, get a, create a model that doesn't have very many conflicts in it between the structural and the MEP and the architectural. But if you do have them from now, that's okay. Okay, so you don't need to be doing this. I just want to be really clear, because really, this assignment is supposed to be the one that's kind of easy to get done, like around the break, as opposed to being like the, oh, I lost four days of the break just trying to get it done. Yeah, if, if you're spending more than like a day on this, you, you really, yeah, right, because you, <laughs> you missed the point, and you're going deeper than you need to be. Okay, so like, uh, yeah, keep it light. That's, this, was, this was intended to be a light one. Okay, so yeah, yes. <coughs> Toilets, fixtures, main, connect. I'm done. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's about the experience. Okay, no, one, no one's going to become an MEP designer overnight. Let me say no to that. Let me close up this one. I'm going to close up some of these other models just because on my little machine, you know it'll crash if I go ahead and open this all up at the same time. So I'll say no to that. And what I'm going to do is now open up Navisworks. Let me see if I can find Navisworks in here. You'll find Navis works on your machines, I think, for the most part. If not, don't worry. Just follow along, and we'll get it installed while you're gone over the break. Um, let me find it. Where to go? Navis works freedom. Navis works manage. There it is. 2010. Manage is actually the tool we want to use. Freedom is a tool. Come on, yeah. There it is. Freedom is kind of like oh, it's kind of like the difference between Acrobat and Acrobat Reader. Okay. You know, where freedom lets people read your files but not really do very much with them, okay, whereas uh, manage is the one that actually gives you the ability to go back and do the editing and do interesting things. So let's open up manage. 
And we're going to use Navisworks for a bunch of different things over the next couple of weeks. So go ahead and down this onto your download this onto your machine if you want to. Too. Although you can bring the 20, 20, uh, 2012 version on your machine, I'd probably do that because uh, well, it'll read the 2010 files just right, uh, just fine, and it sort of is a little bit cleaner and nicer in the interface in terms of being easier to understand. But I'll do it in 2010 now, just to kind of like uh, you know be working on the least common denominator. So here we are. We're hanging around in Navisworks, and Navisworks really has four big tools that it's really good about working with. It has something called Timeliner. Timeliner is all about this notion of uh, taking your model and applying a schedule to it so that we can do 4D simulation. I think some of you are playing around with that in like 241 or some of the classes. Maybe not. You're using Vico. OK, so you're doing some sort of, OK. Oh, you're on that side there. OK. Well, we'll show you how to do 4D simulation kind of in this tool too then. OK. There's also a tool called Presenter. Presenter is really all about taking these different models. And uh, you, you can do rendering here in this tool. I don't tend to like to use this tool for doing rendering, because I think there's better ones for doing it than this one. So I tend not to use it that way. There's a tool called Clash Detective in here. And that's the one we're going to spend some time working with today. Clash Detective is really all about finding these different conflicts and giving you a way to manage them. So we'll focus our attention there right now. Oh, and where's the fourth one? I'll think about that in just a second. But to get our style started, let's go ahead and we're going to open one of those NWC files. So if you can. Go out to the L drive and do this. I'm going to switch to the NWC file format. There's a couple of different file formats in here. Let me kind of think about how they all work. There is the NWC, the cache file. That's the file we use for exchanging things. There's something called the NWF file. That's a file set where that's kind of it's my Navisworks information with pointers to the external files. Okay, but it doesn't actually have your external files in them. OK, so it's like a, like a shell file that points to them. Then there's an NWD file. The NWD file has all the data it needs in the file, OK? But you really can't do very much with it. So there's this whole, actually, let me clarify. When we send them around, we, we send this around the NWDs, correct? I was going to it's like sending around a PDF. And NWF is the one that calls out to the NWC during those. Yeah. Like Self-contained. Oh, like that. Map. Fantastic. So, what should we tend to do is we'll do a lot of work and we'll sort of integrate things together in a model as NWCs and put them into a file set. But when it's time to actually share that with someone, if I want to share this with a completely external person who I don't want to have, at, who I don't want to give access to my original design, so they can't take it and modify it and use it as their own, or really start to explore whatever I've done beyond sort of the surface characteristics, I can give it to as an NWD file. Okay, it's kind of like giving you a closed PDF file where you can't do much with it. You can read, but you can't do much with it. So watch out for this in that as you're working in some other courses and you're asking for project data, people can give you an NWD file which you can look at, okay, but you can't reverse engineer the Revit file back out of it. <coughs> okay, so if they're giving you a project file and you actually need to get into it to do some more modeling or playing with it, we need to get the original file, not the NWD. Because it's, it's kind of like the PDF in Acrobat Reader. It just You can print it, but you can't do much with it. Okay, So watch out for that. That will become more important to you like in two, for people who are taking 2.11 next quarter. Remember that one. It will pop back up again there. Because people will, will give you NWDs very freely. Because there's not much harm in that. So Because it, it's a good way of sharing information, but sort of locking it down at the same time. Anyway, I'll go to NWC for now. Let me pull in the architectural model. There is my architectural model. Isn't it grand? It's uh, looking uh, pretty similar to what it looked like in the other tools. I can go back to the home if I want to. I can sort of orbit around the way I'm sort of used to doing. That part's pretty good. What else could I do? Let me go ahead and add in some other models here. Oh, let me show you the selection tree, and we'll go from there. There's something called the selection tree. Let me pin it down right now. This is one of these tools. That is actually, what would I say? And it's a common interface, which I don't necessarily like a whole lot as a user interface person, but you know, we sort of get used to it after a while, where there's all these different tools that sort of hang off the sides as tabs, and they pop in and pop out, and you have to kind of keep track of which one you're looking at all the time. 
So there's these different things that are floating around down here at the bottom. There's some over there on the right-hand side. It's got all these panes that kind of pop in and pop out at different times. Selection tree is one of the ones you want to know about, though. So that's why I'm going to pin it down and just sort of make it available to you. Because what the selection tree lets you do is as follows. We can go ahead and choose the entire model. Or we can do things like choose the things at level one, or choose the things at level two, or level three, or at the roof level. Or if you expand on down, you can get to sort of specific elements. So any element that we specifically choose will be highlighted. You go down to level one. Now, you can't necessarily see what I've highlighted right there. So let me do something like this. Unselected hidden. If I say unselected hidden, what it's going to do is hide everything except the selected items. Okay, it's a weird way of saying it. Did it work? Let me, uh, oh, back in 2010, I have to remember how to unhide these in terms of doing that. Because I know how to do it in the latest one. Is it show? Ah, and turn it off. Thank you. It moved around a little bit in later versions where there's actually sort of an explicit menu choice. So if you choose a bunch of different items, for example, if I want to look at all the different 18-inch diameter columns and say unselected hidden, it'll show me all those. And then I can kind of turn that back off again to kind of turn them on. So I can choose specific items. And if you look at specific items, if we go zip it on down further, we can find out a little bit about what it is. We can find out all about its properties. In fact, there's a whole little properties window in here where we can actually start looking at, these are all just diff all the different like instance properties. So we can go ahead and choose different <coughs> things. Actually, this, these are selection sets based on them. I take that back in terms of what's going on. But we can basically interrogate all the information in the model, the things about its geometry, its size, its volume, its area, its specific ID, its mark, it's all that stuff. It's all kind of buried alive here in this whole data structure. So this makes it available. So we can take a ring in the architecture model and we can select some specific things in there. But let's also go ahead and bring in some other models. OK, architecture model came in from Revit just fine. Let's go ahead and bring in another model. To bring in the second model, we're going to append it as opposed to opening it. So we'll say append. And I'll choose the structural model and bring it on in. And with any luck, it's going to show up just fine in there. Let me take the architectural model and hide that for you right now. And that's all that's there in the structural model now. I can kind of take a look at that. Let me uh, unhide that. A little hard to see different things in there. Maybe even in here, if I went through <coughs> and at that level just went ahead and hid the uh, first floor items, then I can start to see the structural model underneath there. Okay, so I can see this little bit of the structural model underneath it. But the whole idea with this is really that we can go ahead and like just look at how these different things work relative to each other. Now, if you have models that come in not origin to origin, okay, you may need to move them around a little bit relative to each other to transform them, to kind of get them into place. And I won't literally do that right now here together, because we're going to run a little short on time today. But maybe we'll show you that next time in terms of how you transform things and move them around. Just so you know where it kind of generally exists. Oh, I got to find it, whether it's up in here. It's under the file menu. I got to remember where this always is. It changes from version to version. I'm not going to find it right now. Well, trust me, there's a way to transform them, which is basically just moving around the coordinates. So for example, if this thing is at a location I don't like, or in the new model, is the, so say the structural model is out of alignment with the architectural model, what I can do is I can move it around in XYZ space to get it to line back up again. Okay, so that's another way to sort of fix the coordinates problem because it's quite possible that you know, all your consultants didn't use the same coordinate system. So in that case then, as a matter of practice, let's talk about this. It's a really good idea to have everyone in their model put some sort of benchmark, just some sort of object that can be selected, which will be the zero, zero point so that you can all register relative to that thing. So if everyone has, even if it's just sort of a crossing of two lines somewhere, or it's a 3D object. That'll really help everyone later pull those things together and just use them as resolution mark, or yeah, to, to resolve them against it. Yeah. So go ahead and think about doing that. 
Let me also go ahead and pull in one more model. Let me pull in that MEP model. Great. So I got actually all the models together. And if I go through and I select anything in here, looks like most things are associated on no level. That's interesting. Oh, because I'm in the wrong space. Let me go over to the other one. The standard view. So I can start looking at different things. And if I, again, let me sort of uh, hide everything else. That's not very good. There we go. These are all these little pieces of, it's really like pieces of, uh, what, those are the air terminals, as well as, what are those, those are pieces of ductwork that are connecting together. <laughs> sort of a weird thing that happens with the models though, and this is something that actually has gotten much, much better over time, is that right now, things like, oh, the ductwork are actually showing up in no level, whereas the ductwork connections are showing up on level one. And that's really a known problem in some of the earlier versions of that. The models, in terms of the data format they're exporting, has gotten much, much better about sort of handling this whole notion that things are showing up at different levels and assigning them to appropriate levels. So we definitely have a problem within transferring things around that things sometimes move around because the data format and the way it's encoded isn't really great for sharing. But that's something that keeps on getting better as we move from version to version. Okay, so you can just sort of explore your various models like this, and this is an okay starting point in terms of what's going on. But let's go ahead and do something that's a little more interesting, and that is to actually start thinking about how we can resolve the clashes. So this actually has this tool called Clash Detective, which is a really good one to play with. And let me see if I can find it down here, not over there. Let me pull it up over here. Clash Detective, or there in the toolbar. Let me close up the selection tree so we don't have to look at that right now. See if we can pull that up. This in many ways should look sort of familiar because it's not all that different than what we were looking at in Revit just a few minutes ago, where we have features of one model, features of another model, and we can start you know, looking at those two relative to each other and sort of see where the clashes are. So we have different types of clashes to look at. We have hard clashes. Hard clashes are things that actually physically do bump into each other or overlap each other in some way. We have things which are called clearance clashes, where because of an item requiring a certain amount of clearance, whether it's two inches apart or three inches apart, you know, they're close enough to create a clash, or what's considered a clash. We also have duplicates, okay, duplicates being every once in a while. Two different people put the same exact thing in the model in two different places, and you want to know about that so you don't double count it. Okay. There's also a whole notion here about time-based clashes, and that's kind of a very interesting one. If you think about things moving around at a construction site through the entire process, it may be that if we consider time at one specific point in time, you know, I can't actually put some piece of the physical element in there because there's still a crane in the way, or there's some temporary piece of equipment that's there. And if you've modeled those, you need to actually sort of map it against the timeline to figure out really whether there really is a clash or not. Because it'll look like there is, but maybe they're at two different points in time and it really won't matter. So it allows you to do some very detailed coordination. But how we use it is, for example, let me go ahead and just choose the structural model. I'll do a really gross one just to start with. I'll choose the structural model and I'll just intersect it with the MEP model. And that's going to be close enough to get us going. It'll show us very similar things, where beams conflict with ductwork or conflict with piping, stuff like that. I can say, stick to the hard clashes within a tolerance of 0.01 meters. And I'll say, start. And it'll go off and do something. And it'll say, hey, it found 25 instances where something is clashing as far as it's concerned. OK, so very similar to what it did before. Let's take a look at the results and see what that looks like. It's the next tab over. This does a little bit better job for us, because in this one, I have the different clashes listed here, and I can go moving on down through the clashes. Let me go ahead and actually hide the uh, architectural model, since that's you know, really just kind of cluttering up our view right now in terms of what's going on. So let me choose this, and I will just hide that one, OK? Because that will make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. So I can start to see and move around within here where the different clashes are. So there's a clash between, and the way to look at it is down here at the bottom. 
there's a specific beam kind of clashing with a specific piece of the MEP model, and I have something going on as a clash. It's just something that needs to be resolved. The nice thing is we can do these things like, oh, animate the transitions. We can sort of dim the other things if we really want to focus on it. Whatever we need to do there to really make it very clear where those different clashes are. Okay, now, those clashes have statuses, and those clashes can be assigned to people. So we can actually start managing the whole issue of, really, we sit around at big meetings and look at these clashes and figure out, oh, okay, yours. Yeah, this one's yours. You know, <laughs> can we kind of do things like that to kind of get them working together? But at the tail end of this, what you want to do is we can go through and produce a report. And let me go ahead and do this. I'll do this my uh, clash report, session one. Okay, have a great break. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, it's, it's time to leave. So, like, anyone who wants to, like, get up and please do. Um, let's just run, write this out and show you what it looks like. Did I save it? I didn't save it yet. Okay. And when it gets done writing its report, what it does is, if I go back out there to my drive, and I'll say, where did it go? I put it on my local drive. And I'll go to 110, session 16. And my clash report is right there. If I choose to open my clash report, oh, come on, I didn't record every, oh, what did I do? I have the wrong setting set up in there. It'll actually produce a very nice report that shows you clash by clash, put a little picture in there, tell you exactly where it is. I gotta figure out what I messed up there. But let me not belabor you guys, kind of going, oh, oh, put the old ones in there too. I had run this beforehand, so they're considered old clashes. Let me rewrite this report. It really is dramatic. I don't want you to miss it. OK, then over here. So it'll go through and give you a report, just where it is, what elements are involved, a picture of what the clash is. So the idea is we can assign these to different people, and we can start knocking them down one at a time. But the point of the meeting is really at, well, we're together to figure out who, what strategy we're going to use to resolve it. So you can go, go off and resolve it in your own files. Then we'll bring your files back together and verify that they actually did get solved. That's the idea of the workflow. Yes? You do in this version. Now, let me tell you about a nice feature in 2012 that got implemented. So if you've downloaded 2012, it's better that way. And if you're working with that, there's this feature called Switchback. And Switchback is really cool, because Switchback lets you say, hey, I'm looking at a conflict over here. Let me switch back over to the MEP model and show me, highlight the element that I need to change. Okay, so you can make the change, then you can switch back, and it'll take you back over to Navisworks, okay, and get you to the same thing and test show you whether you cleared it up or not. So switch back is a really cool feature implemented now, where it'll make that a lot you know, more fluid. In 2010, it was still kind of a manual, kind of go off and do it this way. Okay, so you know that's a good reason as you as if you're in the construction program and you're working with this stuff day in and day out, just go with 2012 because you know those little features got much much better. And again, there's no harm, because it'll read your two 2010 files just fine, and you're not ever going to save it back to Revit 2010, so you might as well just work in 2012 for Navisworks. Does that make sense? OK. And we'll get 2012 installed on all the machines and the Scythe machines very soon. OK. Let's go ahead and break for today. Have a fantastic holiday week. And again, don't spend too much time on this. It's really designed to kind of be an easy one. so. Yeah, it, yeah, not a lot of design work here. It's really just kind of trying to get the feel for putting the different sorts of systems in there. Kind of leave it at that and have a, just a good time enjoying yourself as opposed to slaving over all the 210 stuff. But have fun playing with it if you want to. And uh, if you have any questions, just holler at us. We'll try and keep you going through the break. Okay, thank you.